I'm sure that at some point, many of us have been told that it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And while that is partly true, because the way that we say something is very important, the words that we choose are equally as important. Our words have meaning, particularly when it comes to child protection. So at ICMEC, we believe that safeguarding children is a responsibility that every one of us shares. So let's have a look at some essential elements of child protection terminology so that we are all armed with the best resources to continue to make the world a safer place for children. Today, we're going to be looking at three main things. We're gonna look at how we frame conversations. Then we'll look at terminology examples before looking at some legislation, all through a child protection lens. So first up, it's framing. So framing is all around us. It shapes how we see the world. Celebrities use framing to project a certain image to their fans. Politicians use framing to position an issue in a way that will appeal best to their constituents. And whether we realize it or not, we as individuals and we collectively as a society also frame issues that are important to us. So framing is everywhere. And that is why we need to choose our words very carefully. So if framing is so important and it's everywhere and everyone is doing it, what exactly is it? Well, framing is a communication tool and it involves selective control. It is choosing particular words to present information. It regulates perception and also the acceptance of a particular meaning. So framing stimulates the decision-making process by highlighting particular aspects and eliminating others. And by doing this, our framing is actually affecting how people understand a concept and how they respond to it. People are consistently irrational. They often rely on mental shortcuts for their own reasoning. So Paul Thibodeau and Lara Boroditsky took framing a little bit further in their study in 2011 when they looked at language and specifically metaphors and how they play a role in people's reasoning. And the, the results were very interesting. What they found was that in the context of crime, framing has a stronger effect on a person's reasoning than their own views. So in the study, Participants were presented with a statement about crime in, a, in the hypothetical city of Addison. So half of the participants um, were receiving a statement where a couple of the words had been changed. And specifically, that was crime and the way that it was described. So for half of the participants, crime was described to them as a beast preying on the city of Addison. For the other half of the participants, crime was described as a virus infecting the city. So the statement also included statistics about crime, but they remain the same for both groups of participants. So the only difference in the statements were the metaphors used to describe crime. So what the study found was that simply changing that metaphor in the statement heavily influence people's belief about crime. And those exposed to the beast metaphor were more likely to believe that crime should be dealt with by using punitive measures. Whereas those exposed to the virus metaphor were more, more, more likely to support reformative measures. So one of the most remarkable things about this particular study is that the influence of the metaphor was covert. So when participants were asked about what influenced their decision, not one of them mentioned the metaphor. They instead pointed to other aspects of the statement that were actually the same. So the statistics. This shows us that our words have a profound influence on how we conceptualize and how we act uh, with respect to important societal issues. And that exposure to even just a single metaphor can induce substantial differences in opinion and about how we solve problems.
So knowing that something as simple as a metaphor can covertly influence our reasoning, how do we ensure that our framing is child-centric and always acting in the best interests of children? Well, with a shared vocabulary comes common base level comprehension that allows everyone to have the same information and comprehend it in the same way. So in the fight against sexual exploitation and sexual abuse of children, terminology is not just a matter of semantics. It, det it determines the efficacy of responses. Therefore, the best way for us to frame child protection issues is to use the correct terminology. So we know that our words have power. And when it comes to child protection issues, consistent terminology is critical to frame violations against children as criminal acts, to foster appropriate policy and legislation to defend children, and to create a shared vocabulary around this global issue. So now we're going to have a look at terminology because words matter and how they it affects how we conceptualize problems and prioritize issues and forge our responses. So inconsistent use of language and terms can lead to inconsistent laws and policy responses to the same issue. So a lack of commonly accepted definitions as well as a lack of general comprehension about the terms that undermine um, the protection of children. ICMEC joined together with 17 other international organizations and key stakeholders to develop the term line guideline, sorry, terminology guidelines for the protection of children from sexual exploitation and sexual abuse. So these guidelines establish a common vocabulary to increase the effectiveness of the global efforts to protect protect children by formalizing uh, terminology surrounding sexual exploitation and abuse of children in a way that appropriately frames understanding while also best rep representing the best interests of children. So the guidelines, uh, which are now often referred to as the Luxembourg guidelines based on where they were finalized, were adopted in 2016 and they provide guidance for the understanding and use of different terms and concepts that are encountered within child protection. They're also available in a number of different languages um, and you can go to the website here um, to download a copy. So the Luxembourg guidelines are a set of orientations that can be used as a tool to enhance the protection of children. Through them, Child protection advocates can familiarize themselves with the meaning of terms and concepts to contribute to effective child protection. Okay, so now we're going to look at a couple of examples from the Luxembourg guidelines. And you can see here that um, this is the key that is used within the guidelines to help provide greater understanding of the terminology um, in terms of meaning and also concepts. So the empty circle indicates that a term can be used without any particular concern um, in the, the context of child protection. Its meaning is generally understood without confusion and the harm is not, sorry, the, the term is not harmful to children. A striped circle means that there is some disagreement as to whether the term should be used or not. And it suggests that care should be taken with when you use it and how you decide to use it. And finally, uh, a crossed circle indicates that using the term should be limited or avoided completely in the context of child protection. So people working for the prevention and elimination of sexual exploitation and sexual abuse of children often have to deal with new terms like sexting and grooming and live streaming of child sexual abuse. And certain terms are increasingly replaced by alternative terms that are considered less harmful or less stigmatizing to the child. So a very real example of the importance of proper terminology is the global movement to use the term child sexual abuse material. <laughs> 
So this material is often referred to by its acronym CSAM, uh, and it's used to describe content such as images and videos that depict children in a sexual manner, uh, and is used instead of terms such as child pornography, child porn, or kiddie porn. So you can see here how child pornography is represented in the Luxembourg guidelines. You can see the stripe circle uh, noting that special attention is required. You can also see a breakdown of the, the concept of the term. So it provides background and context. So the guidelines outline uh, the usage of the term, firstly in legally binding instruments, then that's followed by any non-binding instruments. It then provides considerations of the term uh, before providing details on related or alternative terms that you can use instead. So you can see that the guidelines really provide a lot of context uh, and analysis of terms so that you have a greater understanding. They don't just tell you whether a word can be used or not. And if you can't use a word, instead of just saying it should be avoided, they actually explain the reason why it's best not to use it. And then they provide alternative terms to use. So child pornography is just one of the many examples in which terminology plays a significant role in how we conceptualize child protection issues. The term child pornography and the like should not be used as they do not accurately convey the nature and extent of the harm committed against the child, and they may imply that the child is complicit in the sexual abuse, detracting from the fact that the material is evidence of the commission of the crime of sexual assault. So child protection advocates agree that the use of the word pornography, which refers to legal material involving consenting adults when describing the sexual exploitation and abuse of children, trivial, trivializes the issue rather than representing it as evidence of a crime that inflicts irreparable harm on children. It also implies consent and children cannot give consent. The bottom line is that when children are involved, it is not pornography. It is abuse and it is a crime. ICMEC firmly believes that there is an urgent need to raise awareness of and to make the necessary transition to the use of the word CSAM in order to build consensus in our global response, to harmonize legislation and standardize penalties in order to protect children and strengthen collaboration across borders and to promote conversations that are more sensitive to victims of these crimes. Another example uh, from the Luxembourg guidelines is that of self-generated sexual content or material. So we see this term being used a lot to describe CSAM that a child generates themselves. You may have heard of this type of content abbreviated as SG CSAM. Again, here you'll see the striped circle noting that special attention is required. The guidelines explain that while self-generated content in itself it's not necessarily illegal or socially unacceptable, but there are risks that any such content can be circulated online or offline to harm children or to be used as a basis to extort favors from them. So there is the potential risk in using the term self-generated as opposed to coercive, since this might imply that the child is to blame for the abuse that may result from the generation or production of that material. So when content is self-generated by children and no adult is visible in the material, the reasons behind its production are sometimes disregarded. And although children may willingly produce sexualized content, this does not mean they consent to or are responsible for the exploitative or abusive use and or distrib distribution of these images. So when using the term self-generated, it's important to be aware of the risk of implicitly or inadvertently placing the blame on the child who has produced the image. Another example from the Luxembourg guidelines is sexting. This term 
has an empty circle, indicating that it can be used without any particular concern in the context of child protection, and that its meaning is generally understood without confusion or the term, it's not harmful to, for children. The guidelines though, define the term, but also provide a little bit more context about various forms of sexting, such as unwanted sexting, before reminding us that sexting can also be a form of sexual bullying where a child is pressured to send material. So while the term itself is generally accepted, we're also provided with the context for any potential risks with using the term. A final example uh, from the Luxembourg guidelines is perpetrators of sexual crimes against children. The guidelines explain that offender and perpetrator tend to be the most frequently used terms to refer to individuals having allegedly committed or been convicted of sexual offenses against children. And while the terms are often used interchangeably, they're actually different concepts, albeit with some overlap. So according to the guidelines, the term offender takes the principal meaning of a person who commits or is guilty of a crime, while the term perpetrator appears to take on a slightly broader meaning, referring to a person who carries out a harmful, illegal or immoral act, as well as someone who has been convicted of committing such a crime or an act. So guidance is also provided uh, for these related terms and caution against their use. For example, the term sex offender, this actually includes offenses involving both children and adult victims. Thus, it introduces a much broader scope that goes beyond just sexual offenses against children. So use caution if you are using the term sex offender. The term pedophile refers to a medical diagnosis of a disorder and it's often used inappropriately to describe all perpetrators of child sexual abuse. And another term uh, that we're seeing used more and more in the news is MAP or minor attracted person. It's not actually covered in the Luxembourg guidelines, but I wanted to point out why child protection advocates don't use it. Uh, there is argument that MAP is less stigmatizing for perpetrators of sexual crimes against children. But MAP is not child-centric, so that's why we don't use it. We will not normalize, legitimize, or validate child sexual abuse and exploitation. The correct term is perpetrator of sexual crimes against children, or you can use child sex offender. Um, just be mindful not to confuse that with juvenile offender. Um, a juvenile offender is when a child commits the crime um, as opposed to a crime committed against a child. So the Luxembourg guidelines provide a framework for more effective protection of children all around the world. The guidelines provide conceptual clarity to the terms and definitions used in child protection. And they're a useful tool for policymakers and legislators, law enforcement agencies, and child rights advocates in all sectors. So please take some time to familiarize yourself with these terms and share them with your community. Change begins with awareness and education. So the next time you read a news story or you speak to a friend or a colleague about these issues, take a moment to consider your words and choose them carefully. So in addition to the Luxembourg guidelines, there are actually a lot of great resources out there that are a fantastic starting point for child protection advocates. Okay, so up next, we're going to have a quick look at how child protection terminology is reflected in legislation. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so almost 17 years ago, ICMEC recognized the need to gain a better understanding of the global legislative landscape as it related to child sexual abuse. So we undertook a global review of 196 countries and assessed a country's national legislation across five factors related to child protection, specifically whether legislation exists with specific regard to CSAM, if legislation provides a definition 
of CSAM. If technology facilitated CSAM related offenses are criminalized, and <laughs> sorry, if the knowing possession of CSAM, regardless of the intent to distribute, is criminalized, and if internet service providers or ISPs are required to report suspected CSAM to law enforcement or some other mandated agency. From our global review, we then developed model legislation to increase global understanding and concern and to enable governments around the world to adopt and enact appropriate legislation necessary to combat this crime and better protect children. What resulted was ICMEC's child sexual abuse material, model legislation and global review, which is currently in its ninth edition. The current edition's findings show that since in inception in 2006, 150 countries have refined or implemented new anti-CSAM legislation and <clears throat> 125 countries define CSAM. Unfortunately, 71 countries don't define CSAM and 16 countries have no CSAM legislation. So it's important to note, however, that the legislative review that accompanies our model legislation, it's not a scorecard for countries, but rather it's an effort to assess the current state and awareness of a global problem. Realizing the importance of taking into consideration varying cultural, religious, socioeconomic and political norms, ICMEC's model legislation continues to resemb resemble more of a menu of concepts that can be applied universally as opposed to actual statutory language. That being said, adequately defining the terminology that is used in national penal codes is of paramount importance because it allows law enforcement to aggressively investigate and prosecute offenses. So in our model legislation, we suggest that child sexual abuse material be defined to include technology specific terminology. The definition should include at a minimum, the visual representation or depiction of a child engaged in real or simulated sexual display, act or performance. We also suggest, suggest that child, for the purposes of CSAM, be defined as anyone under the age of 18, regardless of the age of sexual consent in a country. The legal age at which a person can consent to sexual activity, it varies from country to country, which is a challenging obstacle to the consistent and harmonized protection of children from sexual exploitation at an international level. So while a person under the age of 18 may be able to freely consent to sexual relations, such an indiv individual is not legally able to consent to any form of sexual exploitation, including CSAM. So although 150 countries have made significant progress in refining or implementing new anti-CSAM legislation, there is still more to be done. The need for awareness and action continues. And this is the time for us to be diligent, to persist and push forward to bring the remaining 16 countries without CSAM legislation into the fold to make the world safer for children. And to do that, we must continue to raise awareness and encourage responsiveness from industry partners. ICMEC will continue to do this by conducting original research into the status of child protection legislation and policy around the world. We will collaborate with partners to identify and measure threats to children and the ways which ICMEC can advocate for change and will create legal tools and resources that promote best practices on various child protection issues. This is just a sampling of the various research available through ICMEC. We mentioned uh, earlier that we have our child sexual abuse material model legislation and global review. Uh, the 10th edition will be coming out later this year. We also have our online grooming um, of children for sexual purposes research project, which was prompted by the increasing number of cases of online grooming of children and a relative lack of awareness of the growing issue. 
So our report analyzes legislation related to the online grooming of children for sexual purposes in countries around the world. We include sections uh, regarding definitions, offenses, and sanctions, sentencing, followed by an overview of related regional and international law, as well as a discussion of implementation and some effective initiatives, uh, as well as a global review of country specific legislation that evaluates uh, a national, the national legislation of that particular country against a core criteria. So the first edition uh, of the online grooming model legislation was released in 2017, uh, and the second edition will be released soon. We also have our studies in child protection series, which includes the topics uh, including sextortion and a soon to be released, released view on live streaming. Okay, so just to summarize today's present presentation, I think the only thing that needs to be said is that our words matter. One of the many ways that society plays a role in the creation of systems that work to actively protect children is by using correct terminology. So whether that be in raising awareness of the issues that children face, protecting children or advocating for children's rights, it's important that correct and consistent language is used. So with appropriate framing, correct terminology and supported legislation, together we can protect children by changing the conversation for the better. And as I said at the start of the presentation, safeguarding children is a responsibility that every one of us shares. So no matter who you are or what you do, we all have a part to play in creating a safer world for children. And that can begin by using child protection terms correctly. <laughs>